Absolutely. So, question here. Does anyone happen to run a tax system? Maybe you run a, a survey of uh, some national population somewhere? <laughs> uh, maybe someone's just familiar with a graph that looks something like this. Anyone? Anyone seen a graph like this before? Come on. It's early in the morning. We need raised hands. Participation. Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, this graph is actually from uh, an agency with a name something like a James Bond film, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. And uh, in the UK, the tax year ends December 31, with payment due before January 30th. So that peak on that graph, this is actually a graph um, which is uh, the number of sessions that their tax platform gets hit by uh, across the period of time. But uh, the peak in that graph corresponds to 500 million Australian dollars within 24 hours. And uh, it turns out if you have to delay tax deadlines in the UK, the Prime Minister has to meet with the Chancellor, the Treasury needs to find some funds to cover the loss in interest. We may have experienced something like this recently, but uh, the cool thing is every single way you can pay your tax in the UK goes through this platform that the UK HMRC has developed. And uh, they underwent a... Uh I hear there's a national broadband network in Australia as well, so uh, blame my uncle for that. The... Uh HMRC has gone, undergone a massive transformation uh, which has changed not just their infrastructure platform but the way that they develop services and, and uh, put them on, online. Uh, they've created this platform which has about 40 different live services on it at the moment and it's just not just the tax agency. They've actually got around four or five other agencies which are currently relying on their infrastructure. It's been so successful. So if you do happen to run a tax platform, I suggest checking out the HMIC's GitHub page because they've put basically all of the code that they use to run a cloud infrastructure platform across in-house uh, cloud as well as a couple of different private clouds, uh, sorry, public clouds, and being able to scale and chop and change between all three of those resources. It's really, really exciting. So we're here at Australian OpenStack Day, Government Edition. Thank you very much for coming. We are OpenStack and we're a little bit different. Uh, my name's Tom Fifield and with me is David Flanders. And uh, we're different not just because we're doing this weird open source things and uh, we're hippies that believe everything should be free and open. We believe that open source software and particularly OpenStack uh, is the, the way that we develop it is just going to result in better software and as you saw in the video just now, is already delivering real work for a large range of industries. We have a, a number of principles that are key to the success of OpenStack. And of course, you know about open source. You've heard of it before. At the moment, you know, Microsoft is open source, Facebook and Yahoo and uh, Google are competing to more rapidly open source their AI components uh, than each other. But we also believe in open community. We believe in giving every single individual who wants to be involved a seat at the table. Whether you're a software developer or whether you're a vendor, everything in between, you can join our open source, uh, our nonprofit foundation and get a seat on our board of directors within about 12 months if you are very good and do lots of great things. We believe in open de design. So Everyone has the ability to request features uh, for the next release of OpenStack. Everyone can participate in the roadmap and where we're going over the next few years, not just uh, in the upcoming release. But it's also uh, not just about throwing a release over the, the fence. With OpenStack's model, you have unprecedented ability to view exactly how they make the sausage. You can get in there and look at each line of code. Everything goes through a public uh, code review process, which results in extremely high quality software. We've been around for a while. In October, we released our 14th release. Releases come out every six months, 
and uh, the Newton release uh, was written by 2,581 different software engineers. Has anyone got 2,581 software engineers working on their cloud infrastructure platform? It's kind of handy to be able to steal all of these uh, engineers from these various companies. Uh, but they were from 309 different organizations, so it's an incredibly diverse set of uh, developers. We have more than 600 companies in the ecosystem that have pledged their support, maybe by selling OpenStack-based products. There are around uh, 60,000, I, I think, uh, members now of the community in around 160 countries. We've even found some people down in Antarctica at the research station that are doing some interesting things. And so what that's resulted in is this platform that today, you know, when you swipe your Visa card or use your Amex or you know, make a phone call, you're using OpenStack already without even knowing it. It's a reliable platform that many large organizations, many small organizations are using for work that actually matters, the kind of stuff that you would miss if it wasn't there. But we are here at uh, a government edition of this day, so we need to throw up some beautiful logos from agencies around the world. Some of them you might be familiar with. Some of them might be uh, pretty scary given the, uh, the recent changes in politics in the US in the last week. But uh, the National Security Agency, Department of Energy, the Department of Defense in the US are probably familiar to you. Uh, you may not be familiar that entire governments are actually basing things like their digital, digital citizen platforms on OpenStack. So the Mexican government, the Brazilian government both have pretty well established platforms uh, which have been running OpenStack for several years. It's not just limited to the high tech space, even the agricultural departments, uh, there's a couple of them around the world. Uh, and it's very, very widespread. So for example, you may not be aware that in the European Union, the EU Parliament, the European Council, the European Commission, uh, the European Cy Cyber Agency, the Commission of Justice, about 52 different agencies in the EU are based on an OpenStack platform uh, built by a consortium. And of course, uh, you might not uh, be Im immediately familiar. We, we found out recently that the uh, Israeli Defense Intelligence Service is also running an open stack. And when you have the Israeli Defense Intelligence Service and the NSA and all of these fantastic agencies running on open stack, it turns out that uh, they help you with security and you become very good at security. So we recently won an award. Uh, the Linux Foundation, with its core infrastructure initiative designed to represent uh, uh, and uh, protect the technologies that underpin the reliability of the internet have a security best practices award. Uh, it's a very, uh, a set of reasonably rigid criteria and we were actually the first project to win that. So uh, check that out. But this is a presentation, so we need lots of bar charts. And uh, the reasons that uh, people use OpenStack are, of course, varied. Some people believe this open source thing is a great way to do stuff. Uh, but uh, quite a lot of uh, people choose open source because it saves money. Around three quarters of OpenStack users say that it saves them money. Uh, however, there are all of these other reasons. And one of the key uh, things that uh, we'll be talking about today is innovation. And what OpenStack tends to be is a forcing function inside uh, organizations to make that transition uh, to being a bit more agile and innovative. We've all put that motivational poster on the wall saying the IT department is going to be the agile, innovative delivery partner for synergy and success. It turns out uh, you don't just put a cloud in, in your organization, you put a cloud in there and have to change the mindset to uh, do a little bit like what the HMRC did and look at microservices and all of those kind of interesting things. Uh, as well as, you know, the fact that you can choose OpenStack from many different vendors, uh, which is great for people, and the standard platform, you can run applications across multiple clouds without changing the application. So as we saw on the video, the, uh, the world runs on OpenStack. And uh, one of the things that I see around the world, uh, having to visit some of those 160 countries that our community is in, is these signs at airports that say X percent of the Fortune X is uh, running this particular software. So we're mature enough that we've got that now. We've just earlier in the year passed the 50% mark of the Fortune 100. But rather than using vague statistics, I like to talk about real examples. And so we saw some in the video earlier. I just wanted to, to highlight some uh, just in, in a bit more detail. 
uh, State Grid, I think they recently tried to buy the New South Wales uh, power supply or something like that. Uh, these folks have 1.5 million employees. Uh, they own, for example, the Philippines power, power supply. It's a really international corporation, and they run an enormous amount of OpenStack. They consider it integral to their business. Uh, if you look uh, again at another example in the Asia-Pacific region, China Mobile, with 835 million subscribers, they've come up publicly and said it's a strategic part of their business and they're transitioning all of their infrastructure to using OpenStack for NFE. Uh, basically, anything you buy online these days, uh, more or less, is running on OpenStack. Uh, if you're using PayPal to pay for it or if you're using eBay or any of the, the sites that eBay runs. Uh, we talked uh, a bit about uh, the various other financial aspects. And uh, it's interesting to look. We talk, tend to talk about these names with massive brand recognition. It's interesting to look at the diversity in, in terms of usage. It's not just this thing that you require 300 million engineers and 1.5 million employees to, to actually run. We tend to have uh, a lot of small clouds, a lot of large clouds, a lot of clouds of all different kinds of size. This is uh, a graph showing the size of organization that uh, is using OpenStack from some research that 451 Research did recently. And the interesting thing is that uh, 80% of these are outside of the technology industry. We're well beyond just the early adopter stage. We're well beyond just the internet companies doing this cloud stuff at the moment. And to give a hat tip uh, to a bit of a local success story, you may be familiar with the government of New South Wales uh, has recently, well, recently, asterisk, uh, undergone uh, a change in their digital citizen services platform. And they talked about it in the past OpenStack Day edition uh, earlier in the year. Uh, it's called OneGov. And you could see that in the past, in New South Wales, you had your traditional government silos broken down, not talking to each other. You had hundreds of different service channels by which citizens could actually interact with the government. And they underwent a, a transition similar to the UK HMRC, where uh, they changed their mindset a bit towards uh, making microservices, tried to get the silos onto a common infrastructure platform, and uh, create the, the one-stop shop that we all dream of for having uh, interact interactions with our government with. So if you've got friends in, in the state government, uh, by all means, go and have a chat with them about OneGov. Uh, they had to migrate around 50 different organizations onto this platform. So they'll have a bit of... Uh, bit of uh, good uh, information. But uh, one of the things uh, we need to talk about today is innovation. And uh, because we've been around for 14 releases now, we've got all of these organizations, large and small, using OpenStack, but we're not resting on our laurels. We, we don't think that OpenStack is about solving this problem of infrastructure. We think it's about creating a platform that uh, can keep up with the latest technology. So uh, my long-suffering colleague, we, we need to give him uh, love and hugs today because he's both a British and an American citizen, so he's had Brexit and Trump Tough happen year. to him this year. Uh, he's yeah. going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the innovation that uh, we've seen recently in OpenStack. Thank you, Tom. Um, and yes, uh, despite the bad year, I do think that there is hope. Uh, and part of that hope is obviously Tom's talked about the power and what we've seen with being able to take OpenStack and put it in production. But I also want to talk about that innovation side a little bit right now. So one of the, the three things that I'm going to cover just real quickly are innovation and cost, very important part, especially in government. Uh, Multi-cloud, everybody's looking at it, but how do you do it? Uh, and then finally, containers. Containers are very cool, but what do they actually mean for when you actually want to do applications and work with applications? So the first thing I just want to quickly touch on is cost here. So what you see here is a graph showing um, AWS uh, InterNAP, which is an OpenStack public cloud, and then the cost of a private OpenStack cloud. Now, this model has been developed by one of our um, community. In fact, it started in New Zealand with Catalyst IT. Anyone from Catalyst here, by the way? They usually do, do swing on by. Um, 
And what's great about this is it was done in the open community like Tom was talking about, where you can go and look at this data and plug your own data in here. So don't believe me, don't believe this chart, go get involved in the community and plug in your own information in there because there's other cost factors like if you do have a private cloud, how many DevOps are you gonna need? How many sysadmin are you gonna need? And stuff like that. But again, fantastic opportunity for anyone to contribute, not just developers, but marketing managers, business managers, go get involved in the open community. It's, it's it's incredibly stimulating um, and really, really feeds the intellectual side of what you want to do. So I want to talk about innovation in multi-cloud, right? So multi-cloud is all the rage, everybody wants to do it, but it's pretty difficult to do. Um, and as you could see by the survey that Tom pointed out, one of the things we really care about the most throughout the industry is we don't want to get locked in. Um, the, the Oracle versus uh, Java APIs with Android, that's been a tough slog for everybody involved, right? And it's because we need to have some of those open APIs. Hold on, Flanders. Uh Oracle actually has OpenStack products, and we should be nice to them. In indeed. Yeah. And I, I'd actually, well, I, I'd defend both. The point is, I love Oracle, we love all of them, but we all know we want open APIs in this sense. And actually, a good agreement's been uh, reached inside of that lawsuit if you haven't uh, watched it. So the example of multi-cloud, which I really want to point out that I think is exemplar, is in Europe. So Europe, obviously, um, uh, as its mass, has a lot of diversity built within it. Um, languages especially, and actually languages really matter. And so what you have here is um, 26 different data centers across Europe run by 21 different companies. Uh, and they even provide language-specific support in, in, in each of the countries. Uh, and they are all using OpenStack. And what's incredible about that is it actually allows for a single API. So you can access all of those data centers via a single API, which actually makes it the largest cloud in Europe. And if you even take that a step further and you look at all the OpenStack clouds across the globe, it is one of the largest clouds in the world, full stop. And again, it's because of that single API, that single pane of glass. And again, just to drive home the point, I don't think anybody in the room here would disagree that we, we don't want to have standard APIs to, to do this stuff. And OpenStack has been the place where that discussion and where they've actually been agreeing those points ha have been made. So. One of the, the great sides of this is that we have to think about how we actually put together these different APIs and how we build applications. So I will be doing training later on. I'm not going to go into it too deep right now. But if you want to learn about that single API and, and the way one of those APIs works, please come along to the training um, at 3.30 today over in the tech track there. But let's talk about more close to home. So what's actually happening in Australia here that's innovative and exciting? Well, I think that probably one of the most exciting initiatives is actually Nectar. Uh, Tom and I uh, have, have some roots there ourselves. You can actually ask Tom the origination story of Nectar. Uh, and I believe some Nectar colleagues are here as well. Anybody working on Nectar, please raise your hand. They're very worthwhile to go and talk to. They've built an amazing cloud. Um, so it was part of the original super science initiative. Government had the foresight to say, let's think about these things in terms of decades rather than a couple of years. And so what you actually have are eight data centers across Australia, which is a true multi-cloud. Again, you can use all of these data centers despite being run by different university organizations. It has a single API. You can get on here, you can build applications across here. But what's really exciting about Nectar, the thing that I, I get really passionate about, is this graph right here. So along the horizontal, you'll see time. So Nectar actually started back in 2011. And then on the uh, horizontal, you'll see number of users. And and as we, as we get past uh, the end of this year, uh, the hope in all of this is that there will be 10,000 researchers using the Nectar Cloud. And that's amazing. And the reason it's amazing is because of the diversity of users who are actually using it. So that little circle graph right there, I'm going to break that out for you right now. Those are the different, that's a pie chart of the different users. Um, so here are the, whoops, let me go back one, apologies. So the different users, as you can see, yes, of course, um, computer science with 33% are right on up there in terms of usage. However, look, look down that list. What do you see? One of the most exciting things are seeing, you know, psychology and cognitive sciences, you know, who are not developers, are not trained as computer specialists, are actually using these servers to do their research, whether it's to pull data off of fMRI machines for brain scans, or being able to just do simple surveys with their researchers and whatnot. And the reason this is important for all of you in this room is because this is the future. Right, The long tail of people will, who will end up using the cloud, we have no idea where that's going. And 
it goes towards this idea that in universities, is, they're leading this way in this diversity of usage and the way users are wanting to use this. And I genuinely believe there, that, that we, have a po we have a positive sum cloud world actually headed for us. There's so much potential, so much capability in the innovation, and we should be paying attention to universities as they push this forward. I want to go even a little bit further into a more specific use case. So I want to talk about uh, the square kilometer array. They're actually using Nectar services themselves. For those of you who don't know, the square kilometer array is um, a very large science project looking at the southern sky. Um, and they'll have a lot of uh, radio dishes. I am not an astronomer. I will disclaim that right from the start. But um, they'll be collecting lots and lots of data. Question is how much data? If there really is this kind of algorithmic increase in consumption of compute and data, well, what does it look like? All of you will have seen this number, you know, since the beginning of time, you know, through uh, the, the artifacts that we've had. We've produced around 5,000 petabytes since the dawn of civilization. Of course, that, that algorithmically increases. Just this past weekend, you know, the globe produced another 5,000, you know, and so forth and so on we go. Here's the question for you in the room. How much data do you think the square kilometer array will produce in one day? Any guesses? One petabyte. One petabyte. 10,000 petabytes, 100,000 petabytes. And if that number doesn't blow your mind, I, you know, it's, it's the type of thing it's actually hard to get your head around because, you know, the petabytes with its zeros on top of it all is some seriously big numbers. Um, here's the term you need to know. So if nothing else from today, you need to walk away knowing this new cool term, which is we are headed towards a multi-exaflop. Um, future. Uh, and very important because, again, just to remind you, it's actually science who is reminding us of this. CERN, the Square Kilometer Array, Nectar, they're actually the ones asking the tough questions saying, we need more compute. All of those users I showed you, the more compute and data you give them, the more they use. They just eat it up and consume it. There is always more things to look at, more granularity in which to collect, more things to process on more processors. Okay, so I want to qu quickly go over the last bit of innovation. Uh, everybody's heard of containers, I assume. It, it's all the cool stuff uh, that, that uh, all the cool kids are playing with these days. And I want to talk about why OpenStack is really good for being able to do innovation stuff. Tom alluded to it, but one of the really powerful things is that OpenStack is looking, what it fundamentally does is it takes hardware and it abstracts it away, right? So you take data and compute and you abstract it away into term, different human paradigms so that we can use it in the ways that we want to use it. And that's what, o what OpenStack has done brilliantly the past seven years, which is to say every time a new abstraction comes along for using that hardware, whether it's NFV or SDN or virtual machines or bare metals or containers, it's immediately responded. We had a bit of research done. Uh, by an independent research group, uh, 451, and they've actually shown that OpenStack has responded faster than anyone else, three times faster than any other company. And it makes sense, really. You, you've, you've seen all the companies that are engaged in this, and what's incredible is just the response. There's no CIO or CTO saying we need to do containers. It's just the bubbling up of the community. The community immediately responds. And all of these projects from Zune, Koala, Murano, so forth and so on, they're already using them all to the point where CERN is already using 100,000 containers in production, right? So they're using it on their cloud. They've given it to their physicists. And their physicists are using it all over the place. And we need to think about containers also in terms of all of those hardware abstractions. You know, there's a lot of different ways to build an application. And you might start with a jar and put it up on the cloud in a VM, and that's perfectly legitimate. In fact, a lot of the companies in the room, that's what they've been doing day in and day out, getting those applications up onto a single platform so they can be managed um, in a more efficient way. Eventually, though, you'll want to be able to optimize those applications. So you might split off a bit of the application and put it on bare metal, put it on a full rack of servers so it can really overclock and deal with that heavy load. And then eventually you might say, okay, I've got these workers and these workers can be stateless and now I can put them on containers. OpenStack gives you that continuum. That's the exciting thing and so much so, the reason why I like it so much is um, I do training on it myself. So please come along to the training and I'm glad to show you kind of the, the pathways that we've started to see for being able to abstract applications with those different hardware um, abstractions. 
So last but not least, I want to finish on a point. I actually worked in government in Whitehall in the UK myself for five years, writing um, bids, tenders out to the technology community, asking them to use different technologies, especially in open source. Um, and if I was working in government, I'd be very about, excited about OpenStack because of something called the OpenStack Marketplace. So if you Google for OpenStack Marketplace, you can find out all the public clouds, the private clouds, the consultants, the, all the people involved in the OpenStack ecosystem. And right here alone are the number of consultants who would actually bid if you put a tender out. So if you actually are a New South Wales and you want to get people working on a, a platform like that, it's as easy as writing a tender, going to OpenStack Marketplace, and just look at in this region alone, there's, there's over 20 um, providers who would probably bid on that work, let alone internationally. So a really great opportunity and ecosystem to actually um, get the talent that you need to be able to get these systems up and going and working. So I'll invite Tom back up on stage and, and Thanks, we'll do a, a nice little summary. Sure thing. So throughout this presentation, I realized uh, that we haven't really talked about what OpenStack is. So here it is in three simple steps. You get some servers, you put OpenStack on them. You then add a bunch of resources, compute, networking, and storage. Then you deploy apps on it. Simple, right? But the real key thing here, is, as Flanners keeps driving home, is you can run those apps inside virtual machines. You can run those apps in a series of containers. Or you can run those apps as a whole rack of bare metal. OpenStack can control all of that. And so I know that Flanders, uh, he's a very, very keen person who's trying to wake you up as much as he possibly can before Des jumps on stage. Uh, we've got a bunch of action items that we need everyone to do, right? Absolutely. So I've been with the foundation for about only a year. Um, and I'm amazed at the number of resources. And it's because of that rich community. And so I've, I've, collect, I've been bugging the OpenStack Foundation staff for key things that we think the community really needs to know about. So please take note of these and check them out later. Um, SuperUser uh, is a fantastic resource for looking up other organizations. It documents use cases and users who are actually using OpenStack. So don't believe me. If you don't, you don't think I'm, that I'm telling you what you believe, look up, uh, you know, your sector and find someone on super user, go ask them questions. It's, it's a brilliant, vibrant community. People chat, they have a good time. Yeah. So a great opportunity there. Also, the other thing I'll just quickly highlight is, um, we do record all of the summits every six months at the summit. We record all of these sessions. So all of these sessions are online via YouTube. So you can look up anything. That's where there's so much training and education and learning. So this is just a quick set of links uh, to get started. So Tom and I, obviously, as community managers, are desperate for you all to contribute. How many of you are active technical contributors or active uh, user contributors in the community? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and so this is a set of links for if you'd like to get engaged in the community. This is a great way to just kind of get the overall. And again, it's not just technical users. Get involved with our marketing teams. Get involved with our user working groups. There is opportunity for anyone and everyone. And in Australia, we have a really vibrant uh, user group. Uh, really recommend you checking that out. That's where you can go and find the guy from Bankwest or Telstra and then go and have a chat with them about their cloud. So Tom, I do have a question. Now, if I wanted to build a cloud and I'm trying to find talent, what would be the what would be the, the just the quickest way to make sure that that person has some of the necessary, the bare minimum skills to be able to do what I need on OpenStack? Well, I think in your position description, you just put require 25 years of OpenStack experience, yeah, right? right? <laughs> we've seen that actually, it it happens. But uh, it turns out we've got a certification now. So, a certified OpenStack administrator uh, has been running for about a year. So, you'll probably be able to find some talent that's uh, certified. This is a a basic. Uh, certification, uh, which will let you know that whoever has it has the ability to run a cloud. And similarly, if you are a person who knows how to run an OpenStack cloud, you might consider doing that exam. Uh, from the marketplace, there are dozens of different training providers. Uh, if you'd like to learn, uh, they'll get you up to scratch to be able to pass that exam. Brilliant. 
So the other thing which we're starting to do to help um, people into applications, everybody's now trying to figure out cloud applications. We've got clouds, we want to do multi-cloud, but how do you architect applications so that they are cloud native, uh, so to speak? Um, well, we've been running hackathons. We've run one in Mexico. We've run one in Taiwan. Around 300 people have shown up, and they've just been a lot of fun. The reason they're fun is because they're great learning opportunities. If you want to learn how to do cloud applications and upskill yourself, come participate either as a competitor or you can be a mentor. There are they're just absolutely brilliant. Check them out online. There's also rumors that there might be a hackathon uh, coming up here in Australia. So please stay tuned for that. Watch the OpenStack Twitter account because um, we definitely would like to uh, bring you all together for those interested in doing cloud applications. Big question, though. What is the summit? We keep talking about the summit, yeah. but what is the summit? Indeed. Well, you answered this when we were practicing, <laughs> but I'll give it a go. Uh, the summit is our major international conference. Every six months, we get the entire OpenStack global community together. We typically get people between 50 or 60 different countries, uh, kind of five to 7,000 people is the size of these events at the moment. And it's where we have keynotes that are much better quality than this one. Uh, we have a traditional conference with content uh, for everyone from those having a title that's uh, three letters long, starting with C, all the way through to your deep, deep engineering expertise. Uh, we have a marketplace where you can go and talk with a couple hundred different vendors. We also have uh, a bunch of training. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you'll get a brief glimpse of it if you come over to the, the training, but more and more we're creating the um, Upstream University as well as OpenStack Academy, which is the place you can come just to learn everything, whether it's the operator level, the application developer level, um, and so forth and so on. So really great opportunity if you've got new staff and you need to get them sped up, send them to OpenStack Academy. And that's one half of the event. The other half of the event is where we get all of the developers, all of the users, all of the application developers together in a room, product managers, whoever wants to turn up and plan the next release of OpenStack. Anyone can participate. You can wander into those rooms and uh, help design the, the feature that you know and love or uh, grab someone by the, uh, the, the scruff of the shirt about that bug that's been annoying you. So the next one's going to be happening in Boston, week of May 8th, 2017. However, if uh, your travel budget doesn't stretch that far, uh, you can watch all of the YouTube videos online and then wait until... Drum roll, please. <laughs> Sydney. We're going to bring this massive international event to Sydney. Uh, we'll probably be one of the first uh, events in the new International Convention Center in Sydney, taking over the entire space. So put the week of November 6, 2017 on your calendar. We want everyone here to buy a ticket. Tell all of your friends to buy a ticket. Get your entire company there if you possibly can. Uh, and join your local user group. They normally put out some discounts for tickets, so uh, check that out. And we're going to try and make it one of the largest IT com conferences in Australia. Well, we'll see if, how we go. Well, if the numbers have shown us in the past, um, there was 5,000, I believe, in Barcelona. Is that correct? Just short of? Yeah, but uh, Austin actually got a bump around 7,000. Yeah, so, that's right. And these are people that stay for five whole days. It's not like a trade show where people just come in, look at the marketplace, and leave. It's a, an honest <laughs> conference. And last but not least, the thing which you know makes us <laughs> sit on long, long plane journeys and work till the wee hours of the morning and take calls at 3 a.m. for working groups, um, for us, it really is about the love of the community. And I can't stress this enough. It's one thing to sell a product. It's another thing to get involved with that and understand it and get involved with like-minded people. Um, Tom and I often joke that we, we don't really have any friends at home. And one of the reasons is, is because our friends are all over the world. You know, we're always on IRC or we're always on mailing lists. And we're having these conversations with people that we do get to meet up with every six months or so. And it's really what makes it a rewarding experience and a valuable experience. And most importantly, I genuinely believe that it helps push your organization forward because you do know what's happening out in the world. Um, Indeed. So if you do work for a government agency and you'd like a back channel into the technical areas of another government agency, you can do that via the OpenStack community. Uh, so you're all, all now a part of the OpenStack community, by the way. Thank you very much and welcome. And uh, hope you have a great time with OpenStack. Thank you. Thank you.